spin a minute. Roll the intro. So, back fishing again. Today is the today's a Friday. It is the third of April. No, May, 3rd of May, and I have a day off, so I've come fishing. This week on the urn, there is two major festivals. There's the classic, and then there is the king of the urn. So it being the final day of the classic, the popular stretches in the town are all being used for the match. So I have come to an unpopular stretch called a crustle. It's a little landlocked venue on the way down to Dolan's Ring. It used to be stocked, it was stocked years and years ago with tench. It used to be really really fun, really really good. But as the uh, as communities that came to this country to work des descended on the place, they started to eat them and kill them. That's not a slight against all Eastern Europeans. I know there's good guys among them. And yes, there's Irish people that kill coarse fish too and all that sort of shit. But when you had designated coarse fisheries, they were tended to be, you know, left alone. But So I'm here today. I've, got, I've chucked the feeder out just over the, into the bay over here. I'm more here to get out of the house for a couple of hours, you know. Working full time's a, a stressful thing. And then you come home and you have a small child. We recently got new double glazing windows and doors put in the house. Well, that kind of forced me to clean the garage. And I found a load of fishing tackle that I don't really use anymore, so I'm going to have to... Uh, Rehome it, move it on. So there'll be a few items of fishing tackle kind of getting put on the old Facebook pages if people want them. Yes, as well, I will get round to doing a full walkthrough of the boat. I will get round to that. You know, I didn't really fancy towing the boat down to here today and going fishing off the boat. I decided just to go and do some course fishing. So I have a feeder rod set up and I have a 13 foot float rod set up. And so far on the feeder rod, I'm getting nothing. I know that there's bream in here, I know that there's tension here, but again, catching them is another story. Bait wise, the ground bait today is um, super roach mixed one on one with brown crumb and a healthy dose of. Uh, Vanilla from Census Vanilla Liquid Sweet mix basically On the hooks, casters, maggots, worms, corn and hemp So I'm deliberately casting kind of close to this bank of lilies Because if there is the odd tension here I'm expecting them to be kind of stuck to the lilies Something's hit the maggots.
four seconds from the feeder hits the surface to it hits the bottom with a 30 gram feeder. So it's not very deep. But at least the sun's shining. Oh. Get a bit of a sun tan. Also have a float rod set up and did some plumbing about. The float will be uh, about six inches off the bottom. A few moments later. The feeder rod wasn't really doing the, doing the job for me, so I went to the float rod. Not fishing far out. Catching little stunted roach and a skimmer, one skimmer. I also have a jack pike in front of me that's nipping my, uh, my roach as I'm bringing them in. Again, there's nothing over five inches. Stuff like this, little roach. That's actually a rod, well done. I now have three species, a, a roach, a rod, and a skimmer. I'm trying to get better quality of fish, so I'm putting three maggots on the hook. <laughs> it's not working. I'm getting the usual small roach. Oh well. More moments later. Um, as soon as I switched to the float rod, I started the well, the feeder rod got a, a couple of decent, a couple of roach. Nothing bigger than about six inches. So coming to the float rod in front of me, I'm catching the little stunted roach. I've actually caught a roach, a rod, and a, a bream. A little skimmer. So I've caught three different species. Mm -hmm. In the news, what do we have in the news? Well, it seems common sense might have finally fucking landed with the uh, the National Health Service now going to say that you can't just chop off your dick and call yourself a man. Which I'm sure will upset some uh, some types. To me it was always kind of an act of fucking insanity. You know? Let's let a mentally ill human being chop off bits of their body. I always kind of relied on the old... Uh, if you took somebody who suffered from schizophrenia and thought they could fly, if you took that person to the top of a big building and said, on you go son, show me how good you fly. Well then you're going to jail for manslaughter. But with uh, transgenderism, it seemed to be, you know, let them chop off their dick. So now we have a generation of little kids who were lied to, and I do believe they were lied to by medical professionals, activists, politicians, people who really should, uh, have known better. But eventually it's going to come back that these uh, these kids that were lied to and they're now basically for all intents and purposes a fucking castrated eunuch. These people will now uh, sue the doctors and everyone who encouraged them to do it. I'm just fucking amazed that this insanity lasted as long as it did. Blame the feminists.
So we have the Ukrainians holding on against the Russians. Which is a surprise, I'll be honest, because I thought by now Russia would have just fucking steamrolled them. And uh, Ukraine would have been a suburb of Russia. And if that wasn't as much as uh, if that wasn't a shit show that we all have to suffer with already, we now have the, we then had the uh, the Palestinians deciding to have a poke against the Israelis because that's a fucking good idea, you know. Let's pick a fight with one of the most well-armed nations in the Middle East. The Israelis will have they are basically since October they've basically steamrolled Gaza destroyed it you, know, you have to ask what did it what did the uh, the the big brains at Hamas honestly fucking think would happen so now Europe's gonna have an influx of Palestinians I see America's already offering them asylum. So we're going to have a group of militant Islamists brought to our country to add to the already militant Islamist community that we have here. Guess what we need? More of them. I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. If your ideology says that the somebody has to die for your ideology well then your ideology can get fucked and if you vote for fund glorify terrorism then you're a fucking scumbag don't care what terrorism it is personally I think anyone who commits an act of terrorism against the UK should be given a mandatory 100 year jail term spend the rest of your life in jail away from society same as paedophiles. Take them off the streets so they're no longer a danger to children. Not have them locked up sitting doing nothing. Have them doing menial labour. Turning big rocks into smaller rocks would be a good one. I would have them doing that. What, what will we fix now? Knife crime. That's another. That's another fucking disaster in England. Knife crime. Where we have lunatics running around with machetes. And it isn't just black kids. You know, it's not just a racial thing. You go back years and years and years, and you had white kids called Glasgow Razor Gangs who were running around slicing people up. Okay, today it's not the majority of people doing it as black kids. But I thought there was laws in the books that said you were going to get a five year jail term if you were caught with a blade. So, why are so many people getting caught and not getting their five year uh, stint at His Majesty's pleasure? Instead of new laws, why not just enforce the fucking laws that are on the books? Or would that be too much like common sense? Well, that's a bit better. Oh shit, caught the camera. There we go. That's a bit better. That would be, if I was a pike angler at the minute, which I am not, I am a coarse angler, that would be a cracking live bit. Not that that would be allowed here, remember, it's not allowed. It is illegal to be caught using live bits.
I will do a walk through the boat. I will do it. I'm getting asked asked for it. You know, do a walk through the boat, do a walk through the boat. I will do that. I'm trying to sort out a new fish finder. The boat came with uh, two types of fish finders. It came with a GPS, a Garmin GPS, and a Garmin Stringer, or Stinger. It's like a base model fish finder. And it's pretty good, it, it does what it says in the tin. However, the fella that had the boat before me, he mounted it in the roof. So when you're standing up motoring along, you can't fucking see it. But what I'm going to do is get the, uh, What I'm going to do is get a, a a different fish finder. I'm looking at one that's like a like a 12 inch screen and all singing, all dancing, touch screen, all that sort of good stuff. So I'm thinking of the GPS that's on the boat, taking it off the boat, using the Garmin fish finder that came with the boat, turning it into my navigation and GPS. And then, that's two bites I have missed what is going on here. And then using the, the obviously the new Garmin that I get strictly as a fish finder. Yeah, not gonna catch fish with the maggot folded over the hook. It's not gonna work. I'm actually going to get probably three days fishing this weekend. I'm going to do a day of fishing on the uh, the carp ponds next to my my, my local carp ponds because I haven't done that in a while on a carp, and I miss it. I'll be honest. I know that you guys don't really respond too well to the pool fishing stuff, but I miss doing it. So I'm going to go and do that. I might even see if I can break out the method feeder and have a go at it. Today was just an excuse to get out of the house. Although with all the match angling going on, it's it's hard to fit in anywhere in a skeleton at the minute. So some good weights. You know, been coming out. There's some. There's been the odd uh, 35 kilos coming out of the town stretch. So that's good. With 35 kilos, is a lot of fish. The festival this year seems to have timed perfectly with the migration of the roach and the bream. So they're coming out of uh, the lower locker and system into the river to find their spawning bays. They actually tagged a couple of bream years ago and these bream basically went as far up as Cash, you know, then down to Balik and then they went from the, the furthest possible like area of the locker and right to the river to spawn behind one of the shopping centres in the town. That's a lot of distance for a fish. My own personal theory is that the bream are going from feeding spot to feeding spot to feeding spot. Because in their heads they know that there's a feeding area. They know that there's places on the lock that's probably not what they like eating. So they're going to move from area to area to area. And then at one point in time there's something in their brain that says I must get my rocks off. So they're away to do the nasty. It would be nice if Waterways Ireland actually, you know, because everyone knows where the spawning areas are. It would be nice if Waterways Ireland deliberately made those areas where boats couldn't go and actually done little things like help the spawning area, increase the habitat. In America every year they go through the towns and know all the big Christmas trees that they have. They take all the Christmas trees and they tie breeze blocks to the Christmas trees and they sink them in parts of, the, of their waters that they know hold fish that spawn. And they basically create artificial spawning bays to increase the population of fish. Here, we 
flood fucking flood the river with sewage and that's about it really. Don't really care. I got my boat registered because apparently you have to do that. My boat being a 70 horse that needed to be registered. It's free to do, so that's right, not a big deal. I named it. The boat's name is the Excessive Esox. Hopefully there'll be some excessive size of Esox coming to it this winter. There's also other things I'm going to do to the boat. I'm going to put a second battery in there and use it purely to power the fish finder, lights, all the auxiliary stuff and then have a battery set aside solely to start the, start the outboard. I'm going to run it so that when it's moving the outboard's, the outboards alternator recharges both batteries, trickle charges both batteries. I would like to get a solar panel fitted on the cab so that the solar's char trickle charging as well. Basically I want a boat that is almost self-sufficient. Yes I understand that being Northern Ireland we don't always have fucking sunshine. But if I can get the boat to be to a point where it's uh, it's not having to be plugged in, well then that's a good thing. I've put a four horsepower auxiliary motor on it in case the uh, the seventy has a has a bad day. There's an auxiliary out outboard bracket already on there, so may as well put the four horse on it. My 14 foot sea nymph. My wife's pushing me to sell it, so I'm going to have to do this summer is put a floor into it, uh, sand it back, give it a coat of paint, fix some bits on the trailer, like put a new winch, and then sell it. I don't actually know how much to sell it for. Maybe fifteen hundred. It's not going to have an outboard. It's not going to have any fish finder. When I was clearing out my garage, I found an old Eagle fish finder. Eagle were popular in like the early nineties to two thousands, and I can remember at the time it being quite expensive. But now it's junk. So cleaning up the uh, the garage I managed to get rid of a lot of gear. It's just no longer useful. You know feeder rods that I had when I was a younger man and that ended up getting smashed up and stuff like that there. I've just been them. I don't understand why I was keeping them. No nostalgia reasons. No point keeping them. Must do a proper clear out and actually kind of get stuff rehomed. There's a lot of stuff there that I'll be honest. If you were a younger angler, or a junior angler starting off, I'd probably just give it to you. You know, there's a seat box, the old uh, space station seat box. I've got it on marketplace for two hundred pound. I don't think I'll get two hundred pound for it. I think if somebody made me an offer of fucking hunt of 50 quid, I'd give it to them. One hour later. It's gone kind of flat. So I'm going to take a drive home. Just a short session today. Tomorrow I'm going to be carp fishing. So I'm thinking I'm going to probably roll all these videos into one big video. You know, sort of like a three day adventure of how we catch fish and all that sort of shit. So let's empty out, see what we got. And not an awful lot, but it is all that it is.
there's not enough of one at all. Ouch, what the fuck? What the fuck is that? I'm gonna take that home away. Not really. This is all we got. So, that's it. Not an awful lot. One decent roach. Takeaway in a beer. Day two. Day two of the fishing weekender. I called time about half past three, quarter to four on a crustle. I was getting kind of bored of catching little ditty fish, little small things. Then it went quiet for a couple of hours and I thought, yeah, I'm going to pack up. I actually packed up and took a drive and watched some of the, uh, the professional match anglers fishing the last few hours of the, uh, the Fumana Classic. You'll never believe it, but I've seen uh, anglers with angling assistants, they call them. You know, little gophers that go and get them a, a bottle of water and get them whatever they need so they don't, the, the angler doesn't have to get off the seat box. That cracked me up. Because whenever I used to fish in competitions, it was solely on the uh, your own mag. <laughs> I don't remember anybody ever having having a gopher, but times have changed, obviously. So here is the rig. This is a little 20 gram pressed innovations method feeder, and you can see that the line just slides up through it. Comes to this little bead, and to the little bead. I have a, a little short hook length with a little wafter pellet. Now these pellets are meant to be, uh, I think it's squid and banana or something like that there. A friend rolled them for me. They're meant to be wafters, but they're not wafters, they sink. So, in this here, let me just get the, uh, the, the stuff here. You have a wee thing called a mold, and what you do is, you lay your pellet, you lay your hook bit in the mold. Sprinkle in some pellets, like so. And this bit's important. The way your line comes out is where you put the bottom of your feeder. And you squeeze it. Press down. And there you go, that's your feeder with your little bit, you're hooking everything in there nice and easy. And then you give it a, a short chuck, because we're only fishing 10 meters here. Didn't mean to put that much into it, but so that's it. That's method feeder fishing. See if it can catch some fish now. One eternity later. Thing about method feeder fishing. You need a good rod rest. Because when the, uh, the carp eventually take the pellet, they tend to rip rods off rests. And that's not really the best rod rest to have because it's too easy to bounce the rod out of it. But as I'm only fishing 30 feet away, 
I should be okay. No, that was a nibble. You'll find it because the pellets are, are around the feeder. There'll be things like roach that's in this pond. Maybe even baby tench. There's a tench that's in this pond. And then they'll come up and they'll rattle the, the feeder just to get some of the pellets off it. There we go. <laughs> and it's good fun. It really is good fun. And this is a little um, Preston Innovations monster carp feeder. That's the that's the species we're after. Well common carp. Well there's commons, there's mirrors. There's even orf in this pond, which is quite nice because catching the orf. There I quite like orf. It always reminded me of a big goldfish. You'll notice on my hook, if you can, if this thing focuses, there's a little bit of silicone. And what we do is we slide that to the there, so that this pellet will be sitting up like this in the water. And it'll get sucked into the carp's mouth, and as it does, this is a little, it's almost like a circle hook. It's barbless, you see, there's no barbs on it. But once it gets in, it just, it sticks, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a nice sharp pattern of hook. Do we make them? I can't remember the name of them, the name of the hook pattern. But I know that they're a guru hook. There we go. That'll just sit on the bottom like that. And these little pellets, smaller fish will come in and nip at them to try and get them. It's just a little flick to the far side. And then wait for the action. I've been lazy today. I can't be bothered putting pole rigs on. Just want to sit and relax with this feeder rod for a wee bit. And talk shit to you good people. But now method feeder fishing, you don't really, you don't have to do it expensive. This is a budget method feeder rod. It's only 10 foot. But I've had carp well into um, double figures with this. I'm fishing with this on this reel. It's a little Shimano Sahara. Again, budget reel. It's got a fight and drag. On the bottom so I can slacken off the drag. It's got six pound mono all the way through, except for the hook length, which is uh I think it is a 0.18 fluorocarbon. Oh, that was a drop back bite. 
They usually signal the start of something special to come. <laughs> but no, method feeder fishing. If you've got young kids, that are getting in, or anybody even getting into angling, get them down on a on a pond that's kind of relatively well stocked. This place is relatively well stocked. It isn't quite fish soup but it's up there, it's nicely stocked. Get them down with uh, a little me little method feeder and some pellets and some... I mean, you can buy a bag of Sonia Bates pellets, the ones that I'm using, I think they're like three pound or four pound. Again, not expensive, and that's really all the bait you need for a day, for a good session anyway. Oh, there we go, that's a little nibble. You don't really want to hit those. That's just fish moving around. It could be a line bite. You'll know when it's a bite because the rod just rips around. Or it doesn't. Mm. Or it sits like that there for, for ages. <laughs> And you wonder what's happening. No, it was very interesting watching the uh, professional anglers fishing the Yarn Classic. You know, I stood behind some of the uh, the, the, the guru sponsored anglers. You know, guys that are very, very technically good at what they do, very good anglers. But I was a kid when I was a teenager. You were watching the likes of Dave Harrell, who was, he was the guy when it comes to float fishing. Then you watch guys like Bob Nudd, he used to use, I think he still to this day fishes for browning. He's only ever really fished for browning as far as I can remember. You know, Inner Skillen being good for festivals. You'd have got a lot of those guys, I mean, a lot of the best anglers in the world, come across every year to fish them. I don't do the competition match fishing anymore. It's not my scene, not my bag. Part of me would love to go back and do it just for a couple of days, but it's not something that that I would jump off the sofa to go and do, if you know what I mean. I'm quite happy doing my Pleasure fishing. Pleasure fishing and talking shit to people like yourselves on YouTube. Three hours later. Okay, let's see what we ended up with today. Had yeah, a good day. Didn't catch a fortune, but. I had a good day. That's a cracking bag of little carp. Beautiful. I'll put them back in here.
I enjoyed that.